One of these apples is painted with matte acrylic paint and the other with acrylic gouache. Can you spot the difference? Earlier this year, I reviewed Golden Paint's newest paint line called So Flat. If you haven't seen that yet, please check out the link to that video in the description. To review, So Flat paints are an acrylic paint formulated to dry to a matte, opaque finish. The paint also has self-leveling properties, meaning that it has a predisposition to flatten out brush strokes. Since I've published that video, I've noticed quite a few of you have some questions about how So Flat compares to acrylic gouache. This video will address that. By the way, I've added chapters to this video, so feel free to skip to the parts that interest you. Like So Flat, gouache is also favored for its matte, opaque finish. And both So Flat and acrylic gouache are acrylic formulas. But one is labeled as an acrylic paint and the other as a gouache. Is there a difference? Or are So Flat and acrylic gouache basically the same thing? Prior to the filming of this video, I had never used acrylic gouache before. I didn't have enough experience to offer a conclusive answer. But my curiosity was piqued and I ordered some acrylic gouache to test. And now I think I have enough information to answer this question. The brand of gouache most people seem to love is Acrylla by Holbein. So that's what I got. I initially bought the primary color mixing set so that I would have all the basic colors without spending too much. The set includes magenta, yellow, cyan, white, and black. The theory behind this is similar to the basic colors found in your typical home printer. So if you consider the range of colors that you can get from your printer, you can get a pretty good idea of the range that these paints can produce. And I think this is a really good tip if you are working on a budget and want to try new art supplies. Start with a basic palette, and if you decide you like the paints, you can build out your collection to include a broader range of pigments. I already had a set of So Flat paints to test, so once the gouache arrived, I was ready to lay out a chart comparing the colors. And immediately I realized there was a critical flaw in my plan. Very few of the paint colors overlapped, and most of the pigments were completely different. Which is important if you are trying to make a meaningful comparison. When you look at the label on a tube of artist gray paint, it will almost always give you the pigment name, unless the paint color is proprietary. If you want to compare two paint brands, you need to look at the pigments, not necessarily the name of the paint color. If you are shopping online like I was and can't see the label, most art retailers include a description of the pigment content for each paint color. You can also usually find this information on the paint manufacturer's website. After sorting through 40 colors in Golden's line and over 100 colors in Holbein's line, I was surprised to find very few cases where the pigments overlapped. I ended up identifying and ordering a few extra colors which did have similar pigment content. But even then, the exact pigment blend did not always match. I started off by making swatches of the acrylic gouache, beginning with primary magenta. You'll notice beneath that I also included the pigment name in parentheses, which in this case is PR122. The next two colors on the chart are both paints containing PR112, a form of naphthol red. I wasn't able to identify any paints in Holbein's line containing that particular form of naphthol red. So I'll skip down to the next color, which is primary yellow. This color is a blend of two pigments, PY3 and PY74. Next, I swatched out primary cyan, which is a phthalo blue. And when I was erasing some stray marks, I smudged the paint.
and that just made it worse. The next color is ultramarine blue. And then black and white. You'll notice that on the white, I doodled a flower in each column to test the coverage and opacity. Now that these are dry, you can see the acrylic gouache is quite matte and appears opaque. And while I've still got the paint on the palette, I'm going to paint a quick triad of the three primaries. And once that is finished, it's time to take a look at the golden paints. There is no comparable paint in the So Flat line that contains PR122 or Quinacridone Magenta. I'm guessing they couldn't make this pigment work in the line without compromising on the matte finish or the opacity. So instead, we'll take a look at this Napthal Pink. So flat needs to be stirred prior to use to maintain an even distribution, so I'm just giving this a quick stir. Now this pink isn't really technically a primary color like a true magenta would be, because it is a blend between red and white. But it is a really beautiful color and one of my favorites in this line. The next color we'll be looking at is this Napthal Red. This is the same pigment as the pink we just saw, but it is a true primary red without any added white. Next, we'll look at the yellows. I have three different yellows here to compare with Holbein's primary yellow. And as you'll see, none of them really overlap. The only yellow that I found that had any overlap at all was this permanent yellow. If you look at the label, you can see that both primary yellow and permanent yellow contain Hansa yellow or PY74. So they do share that in common. But both of these yellows have a unique blend of pigments, and you can see they look vastly different. The permanent yellow is clearly much deeper and warmer. So all in all, it was definitely a failed comparison. Next, we'll look at the Bismuth Vanadate Yellow. I felt this color was actually a better match to the primary yellow, even though the pigments were different. But you can see they are still not quite the same. The next color is Cadmium Primrose. This yellow is definitely a lot cooler than the other yellows, and it almost looks a bit green to me. The interesting thing I discovered here was that there are no cadmium base colors in the acrylic line at all, which was surprising to me. The lid was stuck on the next jar, so I have a little art hack here for you. If you get a rubber band and wrap it around the lid, it should give you a little more traction to open the jar. It works for other kinds of jars too. Now I did try to find a phthalo blue to compare to this cyan, but you can see I didn't read the label closely enough and the pigments obviously don't match. This particular phthalo blue is much deeper than the primary cyan. The next color is cobalt teal, and again, I found nothing in the whole bind line that was quite the same. But you can see it is a beautiful color. The 
The next color we'll be looking at is ultramarine blue. And here, finally, we have a paint color that matches. And the next two colors that we'll be looking at, which are black and white, both contain the same pigments across the two different paint brands. So we can make a reliable comparison in both of these cases. Looking at the black wash, it actually looks darker to me than the So Flat Black does. It might be hard to see this on camera, but this is how it appears to me looking at both of these samples in person. And I was surprised to find that the Holbein White Gouache did a slightly better job at hiding my doodle than the So Flat. Although obviously you can still see through both of these. Like the acrylic gouache, you can see the so flat has a nice matte finish and appears opaque. Because there wasn't a whole lot of overlap between these two paint lines, I decided to swatch out three more colors that weren't on my original chart. Dioxazine Violet, Burnt Umber, and Burnt Sienna. And like before, the acrylic gouache will be on the left, and the so flat will be on the right. The dioxazine purple and burnt umber you can see match almost perfectly. But you can see something is going on with the burnt sienna. The gouache appears much lighter. Now both paints are labeled Burnt Sienna, but the gouache contains the pigment PR101, while So Flat contains PBR7, which is the pigment I am typically used to seeing in Burnt Sienna. This really illustrates why it's important to examine the pigment content, because it might vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. Now that we've gone through the tedious job of swatching the colors, we can move on to the fun part and make some paintings. I'll be painting some apples with each paint for a side-by-side -side comparison. But first, I'm going to do some warm-up exercises to familiarize myself with the paint. I'll start with So Flat. In a previous video, I asked for suggestions about what I should paint next and hydrangeas were suggested. I love doing floral paintings, so this sounded like a great idea to me. This suggestion comes from Deborah Exum. Deborah also has an art channel here on YouTube where she posts lots of mandalas, drawings, and paintings, often with floral or geometric motifs. She also talks about her process and offers tips and general inspiration. And I'll link her channel in the description if you'd like to check that out. I'm completing this painting on just your standard watercolor paper that you can find at most craft stores. It's not too expensive and I find it accepts acrylics nicely. For this particular painting, I went with a looser and more impressionistic style which I feel really suits these types of paints. Although you can achieve a more realistic style with these paints, which you'll see when we get to the apple, I feel part of the charm of these paints is in their opacity. I think this looser, freer style really works well. The next painting I'll tackle will be a warm up with the acrylic wash.
For this painting, I'm going to be working in this new sketchbook I bought. This is a Strathmore mixed media sketchbook with cotton paper. So I'll be able to both paint and sketch in this. I also bought a roll of this Scotch washi tape that is also new to me. I'm going to be painting from this picture I just took, but I'll be changing the composition slightly. The beauty of gouache is you can get these really beautiful watercolor effects, but also if you make a mistake, you can use the paint more like an acrylic and cover those mistakes. I'm really excited to fill this. I always end up ruining my sketchbooks, so hopefully I don't mess it up this time. I decided to make a few changes to the composition just to simplify things a bit. For one, I decided to eliminate the teapot in the background entirely. And as you can see, I also started painting the sunflowers in the background, but I felt it clashed with the overall color scheme and cluttered the composition too much, so I just ended up painting those out. And I'm glad I did that. And you can see the new tape removed cleanly, so I'm super happy with that. It is a huge improvement. After my warm-up exercises, I was ready to paint some apples. For each painting, I gave myself a time limit of one hour and limited my palette to five colors. The first apple I painted was with Holbein's acrylic gouache. For both paintings, I am attempting to paint as realistically as I can within the confines of an hour. My paintings often go through an ugly stage especially in the early stages. I like to paint in layers, so I will be making many changes and revisions as I paint this. And then at a certain point, the painting starts to make sense and really comes together. And this becomes my signal that the painting is finished and it's time to stop. In the absence of something else to talk about here, I want to comment on the size of these paint tubes. If you are new to painting and you are unboxing these for the first time, they seem tiny. This acrylic paint contains less than an ounce per tube. Although these sound like very small quantities of paint, artist paints typically go much further than you might expect. Good quality paints like these typically have a high pigment load and I usually extend the paints with water as I work. For some context, I have been painting regularly with this same two ounce tube of yellow ochre for three years and I only just needed to replace it.
For the second apple, I again limited myself to an hour and five colors. These colors are slightly different because as we saw during the swatching, there isn't much overlap between these two paint lines. Since magenta is unavailable in so flat, I chose Nathal Red. For my yellow, I chose Bismuth Vanadate Yellow, and instead of Cyan, I chose Ultramarine Blue. Black and white rounded out my palette. I was worried that whichever paint I chose to use second would have an unfair advantage over the first, because generally the more familiarity I have with a subject, the better I can paint it. But surprisingly, I actually didn't find that to be the case. I painted both of these apples back to back with only a short break in between. And by the time I got to the second painting, which was with the So Flat, I found that I was bored with painting apples. So if anything had a negative influence on me, it was that. Here are the two paintings together. On the left we have the acrylic gouache by Holbein, and on the right is the matte acrylics by Golden. As you can see, they are virtually indistinguishable. There are some variations, which is just me. I could paint these apples until the end of time and they would all be slightly different but I think they are similar enough to make a fair comparison. Of the two, I feel the gouache was slightly more user-friendly, but I feel the working properties and results of the two paints are comparable. So when you really get down to comparing the two product lines, you can see that each was designed with different priorities in mind. Golden's line currently contains 40 colors. Holbein's line is much broader. Now many of these colors are what artists often refer to as convenience colors. Convenience colors are basically pre-mixed paints that you could typically mix yourself. This beautiful pastel lilac shade, for example, can be recreated by mixing titanium white and dioxazine purple. And this naphthal pink we saw in the golden line can be achieved by mixing naphthal red and white. The advantage of pre-mixed colors is that they are ready to use and they take the guesswork out of color mixing. The drawback is that it often isn't pragmatic to purchase many convenience colors. Artist paints can become expensive, and I feel it's best to focus my palette. The Sew so Flat line contains fewer convenience colors. Whether that is a disadvantage, I leave to you to decide. I was a little surprised to find that Holbein's line excludes cadmium-based colors, whereas Golden's line contains 5 out of 40. I can only speculate as to why that is, it could be that Holbein chose to omit cadmium for either health and safety reasons or for economic ones. But it's still a little unusual to find an artist grade paint line that omits cadmium entirely. Part of my decision making process when I'm comparing different paints is the cost. And I'm sure this is true for you too. I looked at each of these colors individually as well as the different tube sizes to arrive at some general conclusions to share with you. Unlike household wall paints, which are typically the same price irrespective of the color you choose, the price of artist's paints varies by the color, or more specifically, the pigment used in the paint. These pigments are classified by series, starting with series one. Each series represents a different pricing tier. The exact scale varies by paint manufacturer, but generally the higher the series number, the more expensive the paint is. 
a Series 1 color like Burnt Umber or Burnt Sienna is among the least expensive of pigments. Cadmium Orange, meanwhile, is a Series 8 in this particular range, which means it is a more expensive pigment. And this Bismuth Vanadate Yellow is a Series 9, meaning it is even more expensive. In order to make a meaningful cost comparison across two brands, it's only logical to compare paints containing the same pigment instead of comparing, say, cobalt blue with ultramarine blue. Similarly, we need to be sure that we are comparing the cost for the same volume of paint. So let's take an example. Here's a two ounce jar of So Flat black paint. The MSRP is 1059. And here is a 0.68 ounce tube of acrylic wash, also in black. It retails for 925. Both paints contain the same pigment, PBK7. So which paint is cheaper? If you were to glance at the price on the sticker, you might come to the conclusion that the acrylic gouache is cheaper. But the problem is that the so flat paint contains two ounces of paint and the acrylic at 0.68 ounces contains less than half that amount. So in order to make a meaningful comparison, I calculated the price per unit or more specifically the price per ounce. And it's pretty easy to do this for yourself. I like to use Excel spreadsheets when I'm comparing lots of different products, just to keep everything organized. To calculate the price per ounce of so flat, I took the price, 10.59, and divided it by the number of ounces in the jar, which was two. This gave me a unit price of $5.30 per ounce of paint. I applied the same thought process to the gouache. The MSRP is $9.25, so dividing that number by the number of units in the tube, 0.68 ounces, gives us a unit price of $13.60 per ounce. So in this particular case, not only is the Holbein gouache more expensive per ounce, it is more than twice as expensive as the So Flat. Now I've been looking at the MSRP, not the sale price, because sale prices tend to fluctuate throughout the year. But what if I were to take the current sale price into account? At the time I recorded this video, these paints were on sale for $6.35 and $7.38 respectively. Quickly calculating this again yields similar results. The So Flat still is substantially cheaper per ounce. So of the paints containing overlapping pigments, I found that the So Flat line was consistently cheaper than Holbein's gouache. But keep in mind these figures can and will change from day to day, from retailer to retailer, and from color to color. If you are budget conscious, my finding was that So Flat was much less expensive than Holbein, while producing comparable results in terms of matte finish and opacity. Now, if stirring or shaking the paint is a deal breaker, you may prefer Holbein. I personally prefer paints in tubes. Now, whether this justifies the extra cost, I leave to you to decide. After I recorded my first review on So Flat, I noticed a few other reviewers complained of the odor produced by So Flat. Personally, I found the odor to be negligible, but I may not be as sensitive as others. I did detect a slight odor, which reminded me of typical household wall paint. It didn't bother me, so I didn't think to mention it. The acrylic gouache, as far as I can tell, has little to no odor. And if you have any sensitivities, you may prefer Holbein's gouache. Finally, Holbein's line includes a broader array of colors, with the notable exception that Holbein excludes cadmium. Golden's line, while narrower, includes cadmium. Cadmium-based colors are preferred by some artists for their vibrancy of color, but others avoid them entirely, as cadmium is a known carcinogen when inhaled. Whether or not you use cadmium is a personal decision based on your own level of risk tolerance. I recommend doing your own research to arrive at an informed decision. 
The pigment content of these two paint lines is very different. So compare both of them and choose the paint that contains the pigments you like working with. At the risk of oversimplifying, as far as I can tell, acrylic gouache is really just matte, opaque acrylic paint. And so flat matte paint performs just like acrylic gouache. I hope this information was helpful to you. If so, please be sure to like this video. I enjoyed working with both these paints and I hope this review gave you enough information to make an informed decision for yourself. If you have any questions or suggestions for a future video, please be sure to leave a comment. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.